All right. First, uh, first uh, bad news. The final exam will be on uh, on uh, December nineteenth. Exactly one month from today. Well, that's good news in some sense, right? We still have one month. And uh, the exam will be from 12.30 to 3.30 in the afternoon at course gym, which I think is very appropriate because, uh, you know, perhaps I put uh, some physical exercises and, uh, on uh, some of the problems, shoot, shoot some hoops and uh, run a couple of circles. You have a question? Say again? You can find this information online. I don't remember, but uh, I hope it's not swimming pool. <laughs> Although for this big class, perhaps that's the only place in, uh, on campus where we can feed everybody if we drain the water from the pool. You know? So uh, last time we had uh, this discussion about this Thursday, next Thursday. So this is next month, okay? December, not this month. All right. But uh, in the meantime, we continue with uh, vector calculus. And today, actually, uh, so we kind of get into more and more interesting stuff. And today we will uh, do some preparatory work for, for a generalization of a Green's theorem, which we discussed last time, to the three-dimensional case. Come on, guys. Let's focus, okay? So the three-dimensional uh, generalization of, uh, of a Green's theorem is called Stokes' theorem. And it is actually very useful in many areas of uh, science and engineering. I'll talk a little bit about Maxwell equations today, because we'll, we'll fin finally have all the tools needed to actually formulate uh, Maxwell equations which govern electromagnetism. But let me start by drawing an analogy. And, and I guess this has become sort of a prevailing theme in this, in this, in this course in the last few weeks. And I have to say that the mathematics is really about finding and exploiting analogies. Uh, there are a lot of things which are parallel. And kind of the same ideas and same patterns play out um, in different domains in slightly different ways. And if you learn how they play out in one place, you can actually gain some insights about how they play out in other areas. So case in point is this, um, this type of theorems which we are discussing right now, which, um, as I said already many times, take uh, the kind of general form uh, integral over some domain of a derivative of some, of some uh, differential form, and here's the boundary of this domain, and then here you have this form itself. So this is a guiding principle, and we, what we're doing now is we're finding concrete realizations, incarnations of the general principle in different dimensions. So let's see what we have, let's see what we have found so far. So first of all, we have uh, worked with a case when the dimension of D is 1. In other words, this, this object D is a curve. Okay? So there are, this tells us the dimension of this object, of the curve, right? But we, always, we should always remember that geometric objects, they live in some, in some space, right? So there's some ambient space, and there is a geometric object itself. And we have to distinguish between them. So if, you, if we're talking about a curve, that's a one-dimensional object. It could live in a one-dimensional ambient space, or it could live in two-dimensional ambient space, or it could live in three-dimensional ambient space. And I would like to distinguish between these cases now. Okay? So let's first look at the case when, when, when the curve is in uh, the ambient space is R, is R. R. That is to say just a real line. So here is a real line. And um, in this case, the, the one-dimensional object which we will be integrating over will be, will be just an interval. In general, it could be a union of several intervals, but in that case, the integral will be just a sum over those integrals. Therefore, without loss of generality, we might as well assume that our domain is a single interval. So that would be an inter interval from A to B. So now we are in the realm of a, of a one-dimensional calculus. And in the realm of one-dimensional calculus, this formula, this general formula, takes the form shape. Um, so omega, first of all, is just a, a function. And so on the right-hand side, we're simply evaluating the function at the endpoints. Whereas on the left-hand side, we are differentiating the, literally the derivative of this function over this interval. So that's the formula that we are talking about in this case. That's the simplest case, really, because this, is, this corresponds to the smallest possible dimensions of all objects involved. Our domain of integration is one-dimensional, and it lives in the one-dimensional ambient space. So next, next we generalize this. So let me do it like this. So here, I will do it like this. Next, next we generalize it, and we consider ambient space, which is two-dimensional. Okay? So now we, are talking about, uh, now we are talking about a more general curve on a plane. So a curve on the plane would look something like this. So there is some, it, can, it now has some wiggling rule, you know, so we can, we can play with it. It doesn't have to be a segment of a straight line because now we are on a plane. Okay, in this case, we also have a formula, and that's what we call the fundamental theorem for line integrals. In this case, again, we have a function f. We have two endpoints. I, kind of, I will now denote them by capital A and B because here A and B really corresponded to some real numbers. And now this, points, this A and B, they represent points on plane. So these are not, uh, these are not numbers anymore, right? And so in this case, um, on the right, we just evaluate our function at those two points. So it's very similar. And on the left, we're taking a line integral over this curve. Let's denote this curve by C, as we always do. And here we'll have the line integral of nabla f dr, the line integral of the gradient vector field. So that's what we have in the case when the domain is one-dimensional. There is actually one more. There will be one more square when the ambient space, so I would have to draw it here. Right? The ambient space will be three-dimensional. And, and actually, we stop there. I don't have to go any lower. Because in this class, we, as, as I said many times, we only talk about lines, planes, and, and three-dimensional spaces. We don't talk about four-dimensional spaces, for example. And uh, we'll talk about three-dimensional uh, spaces later, next week, and, uh, and the week after next. For now, I just want to focus to, uh, in, in, in this, in, for, for line integrals, I would like to just look at R and R2. So now, I would like to make an analogy. And my analogy will be with the case when the dimension of D is 2. In other words, now the domain D in this formula on the left. I didn't put the bracket. Nobody told me. Do tell me if you see something odd on the blackboard. So the domain now is uh, two-dimensional. Okay. So now if it's two-dimensional, we certainly cannot fit it in a one-dimensional space. So the simplest uh, example here for the ambient space is not R, but R2. So the ambient, let me abbreviate this, ambient space is R2. That is really the simplest example. Right? We don't have um, a smaller, we cannot put a two-dimensional object into a small-dimensional space. And so what is it going to look like? The analog, what's the analog of, of each of this formula, all the formulas, the pictures and the formulas? What's the analog of this formula? The analog, or first, what's the analog of this picture? The analog of this picture is the following. It's just a, a domain which looks something like this. Could have some corners, doesn't matter. And I mean really the interior here. 
this shaded region. So this is D. This is not D. And uh, this, um, this domain has a boundary, which I would like to maybe I'll use a different color for it. So let's just call it B of D, the way we did, the way we did last time, B of D, the boundary. So maybe to make it more, to make the picture more analogous, I'll put yellow here also. That's the boundary. So what I'm saying is that the first piece of the analogy is that this red interval is analogous to this red domain. And these two points, these two yellow points, are analogous to this curve, right? Is that clear? Yes? OK. So that's the first thing. So here there's, there's a simple geometric analysis. We just bump all dimensions by one. Whereas here, the domain was one-dimensional, and the boundary was zero-dimensional. Now the domain is two-dimensional, and so the boundary is one-dimensional. OK, just bump everything by one. Now the formula. The formula is the formula we learned last time. In this formula, on the right-hand side, on the right-hand side, we have, a, we have a line integral of a vector field. So it, we can write it like this, pdx plus qdy over the boundary. Right, that's the right-hand side. Because now, this omega is uh, actually a vector field. And we take the line integral of this vector field over the boundary. The boundary, remember, is oriented according to a rule, a special rule, that goes counterclockwise. Like this. OK, what about the left-hand side? The left-hand side now is going to be a double integral because we're going to integrate over d. And so it is going to be the integral over d, double integral, of, 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 of the expression, which at first looked mysterious, but then we discussed last time what the, what the meaning of this expression is. So that's the left-hand side. So what I'm saying now is that this formula, the analog of this formula in this column is the left-hand side of this here. Right? And the analog of the right-hand side of this formula in, in this column is, is this right-hand side. So this is very important to realize. Because once we see, once we see general pattern with all these formulas, they, they start making a lot more sense. If you don't see this analogy, it looks like a collection of uh, different formulas which are simply totally unrelated. But in fact, what I'm trying to explain is the fact that actually they're very closely related. You see, okay, so this is Green's theorem. This is Green's theorem, which we discussed last time. So we have learned this three, we have found these three corners right, of, this, of this diagram, of this picture. And as always, you know, when you, get, when you do an IQ test, we talked about this before, you're asked to complete the, the, the diagram. Right? That's what we're going to do. Not, we will not do it everything today, but we will, we'll start, we will start laying the foundations for proper understanding of what should go here. And that's what's called Stokes, Stokes theorem. So, but we can, we can use this picture to, to see the different elements of what's to come in this corner. Okay? So we should just try to generalize by using analogy between the left and right, and also kind of see the progression from the first line to the second line. So what should this theorem be about? I mean, we, we know, we see that there must be some result here as well. So what should it be about? Well, first of all, we are still within this column, which means that the dimension, I'll use now this board because I don't have enough space to, to work this out here. So I'll just think of this as a magnified corner of this, of this blackboard. So we're still in the second column, and that means the dimension is two. So on the left, we're still going to integrate over two-dimensional object. But now, the ambient space, ambient space should be three-dimensional. Right? Why? Because, because I want to establish an analog of what I had here when the ambient space was R2. The ambient space was R2, whereas the object was a curve. So that gap between the, between the dimension of the object and the dimension of the ambient space was one. one. And so we want the gap to be one here as well. That means two-dimensional object inside three-dimensional space. Okay? So what kind of object? Let me give you an example of such an object. Well, the simplest example of such an object would be, would be a plane. A plane in three-dimensional space. And here is our favorite example of a plane. This is our, you see, this is why, by the way, I erased that. Uh, but uh, you know, there's a big game this weekend, so of course uh, I hope everybody knows about this. And we'll come to the support group here. So anyway, this is a, this is a, this is our plane. So you see, if we were if we were in the top in the top column, so to speak, in the top column, our two-dimensional domain is confined within a given plane. So let's say that plane was was this vertical plane. So our domain would be part of this, right? And and the plane is rigid. So if we're within that plane, that's all we can do. But now we say, okay, there's actually three-dimensional space out there. So let's look at more general two-dimensional objects within that three-dimensional space. And the first thing we can do is we can take, for example, the same plane and just rotate it like this. And we can also move it like this. Right? So we can, this way we can actually get any plane. And then we can take a piece of that plane. So that would be a more general object uh, than before, a slightly more general object, because it would be, um, it, it would not fit in the original two-dimensional plane, which was just this. So now we could say this one would not be exactly like this, uh, would not be exactly like this one. Right? So this is a very small generalization, but a generalization nonetheless. If we were, if we were in this column, if we were still in this column, that would correspond to just restricting our attention to uh, line segments, but line segments which can go anywhere on the plane, whereas before we had a line segment confined within a particular line. Okay? But of course, there's here, there's a lot more to, 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 to curves. We, we don't just consider line intervals. We also consider this uh, wiggly curves like this. Right? So what's the analog of that kind of object in, uh, in, our, uh, in, 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 this, in, this, in this context? So that would be something which does not fit even to uh, in a rotated plane. Right? So for instance, of course, a simple example is a sphere. Or a sphere is kind of difficult to draw. So what I'll draw is, a, is an upper hemisphere. Let me draw an upper hemisphere. And let me, let me use red, red color. color. So this is upper hemisphere. You see, I mean, the, it's like this. So it doesn't fit in any plane. It doesn't fit in this plane. I'm drawing it on this plane, but it doesn't live on this plane, right? Unlike this one, which actually fits in a particular plane. So, right? So this is an, what I'm trying to say is that this is the analog. This is a proper analog, two-dimensional object analog of, of a curve on, uh, on the plane. And um, and um, it also has a boundary. Also has a boundary. Now. I know that one, there's one confusing point uh, here. Oftentimes people uh, get confused. Why do we assign to this upper hemisphere or to sphere itself dimension two and not three? And this is a kind of common confusion uh, about how we count dimensions. And I, already, I said it before and I'll say it again. You have to dis distinguish between the geometric object and the ambient space. Here I'm drawing a sphere. Think of a dome, a roof, you know, a dome shaped roof like this. It lives in a three-dimensional space, but it doesn't mean that it itself is three-dimensional. It is two-dimensional because if you have a little bug on this, uh, living on this, 
on this on this dome, the ball can only go in two independent directions. There are two independent, two only two degrees of freedom, so speaking, which the ball can move. Not three. I mean, it doesn't go in, inside or outside. If it lives here, then that's no, that's the way. That's the way. It is. So, more a more mathematical way to think about it is the following: you can actually think of flattening flattening this dome, this half dome, onto the onto the disk, which which lies at its foundation, at its base. And so we can actually identify points on the dome with the corresponding, with the corresponding projections onto this flat disk. So there is actually one-to-one -one correspondence between the dome, the hemisphere, and the disk. Now the disk surely is two-dimensional. So because we established such one-to-one -one correspondence, that also is an indication, or actually is a proof of the fact that this is also two-dimensional. So this is all to say that it is this kind of object that we will have to integrate in this corner, on the left. So on the left, we will be integrating over things like a sphere, like a sphere or or, or upper hemisphere. Okay. And uh, on the right, what are we supposed to integrate on the right? Well, you see, now we actually, so to, to understand this picture, we look at this analogy, with analogy on this side, crossing from right to left. Now to understand what we're going to be integrating, we, we cross from to bottom to top. You see, if we were in this column, the right-hand side actually stays the same. The right-hand side stays the same. It's, um, we just take the values of the function at the endpoints here and here. The difference is that these are the endpoints of an interval on the line, and these are the endpoints of a curve on the plane. But the structure is the same. So that's why we should expect that going from top to bottom within this column, we should also be integrating very similar objects. So what are we integrating here? Here we are integrating uh, a vector field, which has components P and Q, and we integrate it over the boundary. So we should do the same thing here. So this will be an integral of a vector field over the boundary. So I will now write it out in more detail. And so basically, I have already, I have already assembled the formula that we need, the Stokes theorem. I have already assembled most of the elements. The only thing which is missing right now is this, the question mark here. What should appear here? And that should be the analog of this expression, dq dx minus dp dy. So that's the only thing which is missing right now. Okay? So but let, me write this, let me write out the right-hand side in more detail first, before I explain what that question mark stands for. So now f is going to be a vector field in R3. We should be scared of that. I mean, we understand that the vector fields can be on a plane or it can also be in three-dimensional space. Remember, we talk about wind maps. Well, if you think about wind map, wind map is two-dimensional. So a wind map would represent a vector field on a plane. But, actually, but what does it mean? It actually means that we have to say where exactly do we measure the wind vector for this map. And usually we just measure it on the surface. Right? But in fact, if you look at the entire three-dimensional space, each point in that three-dimensional space has some wind, uh, wind vector. Even, even now in this classroom, there is some, there is some uh, winds. Winds of change. So we can, you, can, you can send some winds, right? But the wind actually depends. It lives in the three-dimensional space, not just the two-dimensional space. And so, and so that's a vector field in three-dimensional space. That's, that's totally natural. So that's what F is going to be, because now that we live in the three-dimensional space, let's look at the most general vector fields in the three dimensional space. There's no reason to confine ourselves to vector fields in the two-dimensional space. So that vector field now has three components. There's some P, which is a function of xyz times i plus q, also a function of xyz, but let me not write it out just to say time, and r times k. Where remember the i, j, and k are the three basis vectors. This is i, this is j, and this is k, this is x, this is y, and this is z. Okay? So the difference is that uh, in, the, um, in this corner of the diagram, we consider a vector field on the plane. That vector field, first of all, does not have a third component. So it only has P and Q. And second of all, because it only lives on the plane, it does not have a Z dependence on Z. So this is a more general situation in two, in two ways. First of all, we have a third component, R, which corresponds to the third direction, K. And also P, Q, and R all depend on X, Y, and Z. OK. So then what is FDR? Well, DR, as always, is just DX times I plus DY times J plus DZ times K. And so you just take the dot product of these two guys, and you find EDX plus Q, DY plus R, DZ. Just like before. Before, we did not have R. So that's why what we got was just PDX plus QDY, which, is, which you see on, on the upper right corner. Now we have a slightly more general expression, PDX plus QDY plus RDZ. So let me now write down the, the theorem which we would like to formulate in more detail. In that theorem, we will have on the right-hand side a line integral of PDX plus QDY plus RDZ, where P, Q, and R are three functions. Three functions of XYZ. Of XYZ. But in fact, it is better to think about them as components of a vector field. Components of one single vector field. F. And we, have to, we, we are going to integrate over the boundary of a over a surface in three-dimensional space. And a very good example of this is, is um, upper hemisphere. So that's just a good, a good uh, picture for it. Okay? But of course, there are, you can always make something more fancy like this. You know, where, like this. So it looks like a, like a little rabbit. Actually. <laughs> you see what I mean? OK. And um, that's the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we will, go, we will have a double integral because we're going to integrate over the rabbit, uh, rabbit's head, or over the upper hemisphere. I want to be, uh, stay politically correct, so I hope I don't offend any rabbits. So let's just do, let's just do an upper hemisphere, just to be on the safe side. So 